Tokyo had its worst day on the stock market today in 13 fucking years. And the Dow dropped more than a thousand points. Turns out the people who claim Trump would trash the economy and start World War III have crashed the economy and started World War III. I'm Stephanie Keith. And I am Tara Manjekovic. And we are Unapologetically Outspoken. Hey, everybody. Happy Monday. Another uh, weekend full of craziness. So let's just start out by saying, okay, Stephanie, it's been what, 15 days now since Kamala became the unelected Democrat nominee. And do you realize that she still has yet to give a single formal press conference or answer any important questions? Unbelievable. Yeah, I guess, though, she really did learn a lot from Biden because She's clearly following in his footsteps, even to the point of using boarding Air Force One or whichever plane it is that she rides as her means of escape from the media when the questions turn difficult or off script, because that's exactly what she did a couple days ago. And the only difference is that she can walk faster than Biden can to get to the plane. And she doesn't trip up the stairs like he does. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, man, it's it's no surprise we're getting a repeat of Biden with Kamala. I mean, I you know, it's like if people want more of the same, then, yeah, vote for her. Um, And on social media, aside from her crazy claims that Trump's going to destroy our country with Project 2025, she has been trolling him nonstop for like over a week, saying that he's a coward because he won't debate her. When all he said was that he will debate her once she's the official nominee. So anyhow, he agrees to a Fox News debate with her and she backs out after trolling him for an entire week. She backs out of a debate like no surprise there. But then she also backed out of the conference of the National Association of Black Journalists, which then you know, lied to Trump and told Trump that Kamala would be in attendance and she wasn't. So he went and got completely ambushed. Again, no surprise. These are the leftist tactics. And, you know, they're just going to keep the candidate locked in a basement and have the media spread propaganda. Like, that's what they do. And on top of backing out on those two events, she also, like you said, hasn't held a single press conference. And um, Trump has been making, like, all this headway with the big... Uh, Bitcoin crowd. He goes to their conference. They absolutely loved him. He did great. And Kamala said she was going to attend, but once again, backed out of that. It's like, what's she so afraid of? Maybe the fact that she has no actual policies or record to stand on. I mean, she's backed out of everything so far. Yeah, but does it matter? Because like, What have we seen for the last two weeks since the rise of Kamala, right? The left doesn't care. Like, they literally don't care if their nominee can perform under pressure or speak off script in public or even have a plan in place to run the country. Like, the only thing they care about are issues that don't affect their daily lives and beating Trump. And so I want to play a clip from Andy Frisella from one of his podcasts last week because I always love the way he points out the idiocy of the left when it comes to this election. And this is all about how the left is so focused on abortion that they're ignoring the real issues. All right. And it's very weird to me how these women especially will make a vote based upon abortion. Like how many fucking abortions are you having? No, I'm being serious. Like we're talking about a functioning economy, low crime rates, not getting into wars, not sending our friends and families and brothers, and dads and kids to go die in wars that don't interest us. And you're talking about being a cum receptacle that has no responsibilities for your decisions. And you're voting on that over everything else. How does that make sense? And then these same people who say this thing about reproductive rights, which isn't even true, these same fucking people are willing to vote for a party that completely erases them from culture. Okay? 
These are women voting for women that can't tell you what a woman is unless they are running for office and they need the women vote. Okay. They are okay with men being in your sports. They are okay with men being in your locker room. They are okay with men dressing up as women, coming to your school and dancing and shaking their dicks in your kids' faces. They're okay with all that shit. All right. But we're the weird ones. We're weird, bro. Okay. Like maybe you guys should sit down and examine what the fuck you are doing and how you are thinking about things. I don't give a fuck if you're pro choice. Or that's not even an argument. The argument is not pro-choice, pro-abortion or whatever, bro. It's that it doesn't affect you on a frequent enough basis to be above the line on where you should be making the decisions. So you're going to forego all decisions that affect you day in and day out and affect your family day in and day out and affect your well-being day in and day out. You're going to, you're going to ignore all of that. So in the, in the fucking chance if somebody fucks you. That's, you fuck some dude <laughs> that you don't want to fuck and you get pregnant, which there's still options. They're still there. That might happen once in your life. You're willing to throw away the rest of the quality of your life to vote on that one issue. How does this make sense at all to anyone? It's asinine. It's insane. And the people that vote for it as the top of line issue are literally fucking morons. They are morons. A little graphic with some of that, but I mean, everything he said was 100% yeah. correct. Well, and they are morons because it doesn't even make sense. Like, she can't do shit about abortion. The right. Supreme Court decided it's up to the states. So it doesn't even make sense. Like, go and talk to your local state officials. She has nothing to do with it. Trump has nothing to do with it. It's to the states. It's not even a federal issue anymore. Like, the whole thing is just shows how much propaganda can influence people that are fucking stupid. Exactly. That's exactly it. And I was reading this article from Fox News over the weekend, and there's this guy, Jeffrey McCall. He's a media studies professor at DePaul University, and he made a really great point about Kamala not giving any press conferences. And he basically said that, you know, the Harris campaign knows what did Biden do? He dodged the media throughout his entire election campaign in 2020. He basically stayed in the basement and he still got elected. So what would stop them from running the same play with Kamala? Like, and she's doing more than he did. She's at least going out and doing some campaign rallies and giving her scripted speeches. And the Democrats literally don't care because they don't even expect her to be accountable. Like they legitimately have no interest in her policy positions. And I bet if you asked most of them, they wouldn't know what her policy positions are because she really hasn't talked about any of them. And I don't think she knows what they are. All these people care about is that she's not Trump and she's not Biden. So that's where their vote's going. It's completely insane. Yeah, exactly. And you're right. Like, we don't know what her policy is. She doesn't have it posted anywhere. It's not on her campaign website. It's nowhere to be found. She hasn't said anything. And you know what? I tried to find the clip and I couldn't freaking find it without music blaring in the background. But I think what happened was she was asked, surprisingly, a, a tough question by a reporter while she was on stage. They said, what are you going to do about inflation? And it was total word salad. Like she, you could see it. Like she was scared. She was stumbling. I mean, it was truly embarrassing. It was a disaster. Ever since then is when she started backing out of everything because she can't answer a single question of substance. And I want to dive into this whole manufactured overnight popularity because more and more continues to come out exposing this every day. So, you know, last week I said that they found out there's this company launch viral that was caught paying influencers and like quite literally giving them talking points saying you have to talk about this, this, this and this to spread, you know, all this positive messaging about Kamala all over social media. Well, now people are saying this is actually a violation of campaign laws because it's essentially paying for propaganda. Like, it's not even asking people to go and just promote her and give their own opinion. They're telling these people, like, what to say. And in addition, a CNN and Washington Post commentator, Catherine, Catherine Rampell, she posts this video on X of a fundraiser event where 
Kamala was, I think it was in Massachusetts. And she posts this photo that shows a crowd of people outside. And by a crowd of people, I mean like maybe 50 people total. But anyhow, like people that were on X, they started noticing like something's not right with this photo. And so for starters, when you zoom in, there's people like holding signs and their hands are going through the sign, which either defies the laws of physics or it's AI generated. And then the sign on the light post doesn't even look like English. Like it looks like something you would see maybe in the Czech Republic. Like it's a totally different, I mean, it's not the alphabet. It doesn't make sense. Um, and so clearly the photo's not authentic. Like there was a road sign and I zoomed in on it and it was like all squiggly lines. Like it did, it was definitely not real. But then she doubles down and replies saying, quote, LOL, getting spam claiming these photos are AI. Not sure why I'd use AI to create a crowd of people in downtown Pittsfield, but these were taken on my iPhone. Sadly, unlike on TV cop shows, you can't just shout enhance and make a blurry background in a compressed JPEG clear, end quote. <laughs> Great response, woman. Great response. And so, of course, the MSM has her back because she works for them and they're not going to verify if it's AI or not. So she gets away with it. And on top of that, remember how I said that Megan Thee Stallion gave a free concert in Atlanta to get like the stadium packed for Kamala? Well, there was this woman on TikTok that lives in Atlanta, and she's been a part of a lot of different events throughout the year. And she was laughing because she's like, they were literally sending buses to pick up homeless people and bring them to the stadium to fill the empty seats. And it's just like so unbelievable. But at the same time, it's believable because this is the kind of tactics that they pull. So then on top of all of that, you know, you'd think that would be enough for one week, but no, it wasn't. MSNBC posts a video clip of Joe Rogan saying that he's predicting Kamala will win. So I want to play the clip for you so you can hear for, for yourself what it sounds like. And she is a strong woman. She is a person who served overseas twice. She, in a medical means, she was a congresswoman for eight years. Yeah. She is a person of color. She's everything you want. She's going to win. Um, okay. So first of all, anyone that knows Joe Rogan knows he's not supporting Kamala. Number two, Kamala wasn't in a medical unit serving overseas. You know who was? Oh, yeah, that's right. Tulsi Gabbard. So it turns out this was an old clip where he was talking about Tulsi. And so she called it out and said, like, hey, he's talking about me. And so instead of like taking the clip down in shame, they just edited the part of the clip at the end that said she was in a medical unit overseas. Like it's they there's no shame. There's no real journalism anymore. It's absolutely disgusting. And, you know, it's just another example of like how far they will go to manipulate things to make it seem like Kamala is just the most popular candidate that the left has ever had. And it's just. In my opinion, I think they're doing this intentionally. It's very strategic because they want to make it look that she, like she's so popular so that when she mysteriously wins the election, people don't question it because it's like, oh, yeah, she was popular. She was everywhere. She was all over social media. You know, everybody loved her. The reality is they've hidden her for the last four years because she's been an embarrassment. She hasn't been able to accomplish a damn thing. Um, all she's done is cackle, you know, and talking about policy earlier, Tara, like I looked up her record as senator and it's pretty astounding. Uh, so she wrote the fewest bills in the Senate with only introducing one bill that became law. So you would think like, OK, well, it's one bill. It must be something great, like women's reproductive rights or something that she always talks about. No, I shit you not. The bill was called the St. Francis Dam Memorial Disaster National Memorial Act. What the? Like, that is the only thing she did as a senator. And she was absent from 55% of the votes as senator, making her the second most absent in the Senate. I'm sorry, but if you went into your job and you didn't show up 55% of the time, would you still have a job? No. Well, look at Biden. 
<laughs> exactly. She's I mean, the same thing, except yeah. she doesn't have dementia as like a, an excuse for why she's like never around. Um, not to mention, she was not part of any committees or subcommittees. And in my opinion, like that shows the leaders and, you know, the Senate and the House are the people that are on these committees. She she never served on a committee. committee. She was the second lowest with bipartisan co-sponsored bills. And she was ranked the most left of all Democrat senators. And it's not even like I could point to some of the things she's done and then critique those things. There's just nothing she's done, like absolutely nothing substantial whatsoever. And then you contrast that with Trump, who gave us a secure border, a booming economy, job growth, strengthening the military, unprecedented peace deals, no war. And like, I just hope that most people are smart enough to look at the substance and not this whole Internet facade that's totally manufactured by the left. Well, apparently she is supposed to announce her running mate by tomorrow. I just saw yes. that today. Okay. I totally forgot about this. I Late last night, I saw this. Okay. So what's the guy's name? Josh uh, Shapiro? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so Shapiro. his, one of his like aides or assistants or whatever accidentally posted the video that was supposed to come out today, posted it over the weekend saying that he is the VP pick. So <laughs> unless they, she pulls out now because she's pissed that he leaked that, he's going to be the one. But yeah, the, it, they leaked it early. And um, yeah, she's. I, I guess the Kamala campaign is not very happy about that. No, because apparently on Sunday, yesterday, she had interviews with Arizona Senator Mark Kelly, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, and then Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz at her residence in Washington. And I guess we will find out tomorrow what what the vote is. But aside from Kamala, like, okay, tell me what you think, because I don't think Trump's doing himself any favors lately. Like, Stephanie, it seems to me he's losing the calm, cool, collected presidential demeanor that I was so in love with for the past few weeks. He's started saying really controversial and frankly, some antagonistic shit. And he's he's isolating the demographic that he needs, like especially women voters and his most recent the, the comments he recently made um, about Kamala not being black, like Nothing he said was false, but it's not sitting well with people. And so I just feel like with all of her supposed popularity, you know, gaining traction, and now we're losing the side of him that was appealing to people who were on the fence, it's just not a good look. Yeah, no, I totally agree that I feel like he's just back to his old self. And we've talked about this so many times, how like he could be his own worst enemy. I mean, he did it so, when he was on Twitter. It was like, just somebody take the phone away from him because he's he's making himself look bad. But on the other hand, I can't say that I blame him. I mean, they tried to fucking kill him. And then he knows he knows they're going to steal the election again. So it's like you can't really blame him. But I get what you're saying. But like, honestly, I think it's at the point where. I don't really think that anyone is not going to vote for Trump because he's you know controversial or like an asshole sometimes like they that's kind of like his signature thing like people know that i i think that people are going to vote based on how expensive groceries are and gas and rent and all of that and in terms of like winning people over you know the whole like suburban white women for kamala they're never trumpers like they're never going to vote for him no matter what he does and so i just feel like it's kind of past that point i don't know i Maybe you're right. But like, I also think too, my, the way I'm looking at it is I'm fucking pissed and fired up. And I think a lot of people are. So I think he's kind of drawing off of that energy. So I don't know. But yeah, he can definitely be his own worst enemy. That's for sure. Um, I wanted to do an update real quick because we did the episode the other day where we talked about the 9-11 plea deal. Okay. How weird is this? That two days after that, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin stopped the plea deal and reinstated the death penalty cases. 
And so I found an article from Newsmax where they were saying that um, this could be the results of public outrage and that Austin is now just trying to help protect Kamala from any bad press as a result of the plea deal, which is interesting. Wait, you mean Kamala, who didn't speak out about the plea deal at all? That <laughs> right. Kamala? Yeah. So it's like, are they literally just changing stuff because of that? I don't know. The whole thing is just so weird. Then the stock market took a nosedive on Friday. Now, this scares the shit out of me, okay? $2.9 trillion was lost. Uh, Fox News reported that it was down like a 1,000 points, which has never yeah. happened before. Um, this comes after a horrendous jobs report, a spike in unemployment, which are both recession indicators. But as usual, no word from Kamala or Biden. And we did hear from Trump, though. So this will be funny, Tara, because you just made that comment. And and then I like added in um, these posts that he did. And it's like, oh, yeah, Trump is he's he's back. So the the first post, and there's like a gazillion. This is literally two out of a gazillion. So go see for yourself. But the first one says, quote, of course, there's a massive market downturn. Kamala is even worse than Crooked Joe. Markets will never accept the radical left lunatic that destroyed San Francisco and California as a whole. Next move, the Great Depression of 2024. You can't play games with markets. Kamala crash. And he's absolutely right. Like anyone that's paying attention knows it. We are in dangerous waters right now. Don Jr. Now this, pay attention to this. This really piqued my attention. Don Jr. posts, quote, turns out the people who claim Trump would trash the economy and start World War III have crashed the economy and started World War III. Okay, this is really significant. And we're going to get into this because um, people say like this is what happens to the stock market right before a war. And I will never forget my sophomore history teacher drilled this in. She talked about this constantly. She said the only way to get out of a depression and to save the economy is with war. And you will look back in history and see it over and over and over again. The only thing that fixes it is a war. And according to Bloomberg, um, it wasn't just the U.S. stock market that tanked. Markets in Asia went down as well, with Japan totally crashing amid fears of this war that's breaking out in the Middle East. So, Tara, it sounds like just as we predicted, war is going to break out right in time for elections. Yeah, exactly. And like you said, with um, Japan, Tokyo had its worst day on the stock market today in 13 fucking years. It was their biggest ever loss in points. And you mentioned the Dow dropped more than a thousand points. And now there's complete panic about a recession in the U.S. And the job market that you referenced, a report came out on Friday that showed unemployment under the Biden admin has reached its highest since October of 2021. And the Federal Reserve apparently decided to keep their interest rates at a 23-year high, and they're going to revisit it again in September. But this is all resulting in investor fears. And meanwhile, we've got to take a look at the escalating tensions in the Middle East because shit is getting beyond real. So, you know, last week, Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh was killed in Iran, which apparently Israel is not taking responsibility for. But they are taking responsibility for the assassination of top Hezbollah commander Fuad Shakur in Lebanon, which also occurred last week. And that was in retaliation for Hezbollah forces recently killing like 12 Israeli children on a soccer field, I think the week before. So now we have over the weekend, all this shit comes out with U.S. and Israeli officials warning that a return attack from Iran is imminent. It could happen as early as today. Um, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps threatened this past Saturday that revenge would be, quote, severe and at an appropriate time, place and manner, end quote. Uh, in an exclusive CBS News interview on Friday, the permanent mission of the Islamic Republic of Iran to the U.N. said that Hezbollah is going to start deliberately targeting Israeli civilians on, on Friday. 
um, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin ordered the deployment of additional fighter jets and Navy warships to the Middle East to support Israel's defense. And then on Saturday, the U.S. Embassy in Lebanon started issuing warnings to American citizens to leave the country immediately or prepare to shelter in place for an extended period of time. So shit is is definitely escalating. And like we have to keep in mind, this is so beyond Israel and Palestine at this point. This conflict has grown to include multiple Middle East countries and and European countries as well. So we've got Hezbollah in Lebanon, which according to a recent article I read in The Guardian, I didn't know this, they're supposedly the most powerful non-state actor in the world. They have an estimated 45,000 trained fighters, up to 150,000 missiles. They have a bunch of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. So that's Lebanon. Then we have Iraq, which is supporting Hamas. There's militants in Syria, which are apparently, they've already conducted three attacks on U.S. forces recently that resulted in the U.S. launching airstrikes south of Baghdad last Tuesday. And I guess we still have around 2,500 troops in Iraq and 900 in Syria, and they're all assigned to counterterrorism. But the government in Baghdad is telling them to leave. Okay, And then we have the Houthis in Yemen who are being armed by Iran. They've already taken part in this conflict. We've got Egypt and Qatar trying to keep peace, but they're getting pissed at Israel and saying Israel is sabotaging peace efforts. So now they're worried about conflict spilling over into their countries. We have Turkey supporting Palestine and threatening their own military intervention. Just last week, Turkey's president, um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, he is apparently a very outspoken supporter of Hamas. Well, he explicitly threatened to invade Israel. And a recent report on Iran's atomic program by the U.S. Director of National Intelligence indicates that Iran is close to producing and possessing nuclear weapons. So it is a much bigger picture at this point than just the U.S. supporting Israel. Like we could very easily find ourselves in a full-scale war in the Middle East. And reportedly... On Friday, Netanyahu's office stated that they were going to send an Israeli delegation to Cairo to try to reset Gaza ceasefire and a hostage release deal. But with the way things are escalating, like that seems totally doubtful. Because then on Sunday, Netanyahu and his defense minister, Yoav Gallant, put out a statement that basically said they're going to continue to stand against Iran and its, quote, detractors that seek to surround us with a stranglehold of terror, end quote. And then during that same statement on Sunday, Netanyahu made it very clear that anyone who hurts Israel is going to pay a, quote, very heavy price. So I don't know about you, Stephanie, but it doesn't sound to me like diplomacy is on the table. No, of course not. Like, we're we're going to war. And again, where is Biden and Kamala? Well, according to Fox News, Biden was shuffled into the Situation Room this morning, meeting with his national security team ahead of the anticipated Iranian attack against Israel. <laughs> My whole question is, do we really believe that Biden, who is so far gone, is really running our country right now? Maybe it's Senator Lindsey Graham, because on July 31st, he introduced Joint Resolution 106 that is, quote, a joint resolution to authorize the use of the United States Armed Forces against the Islamic Republic of Iran for threatening the national security of the United States through the development of nuclear weapons, end quote. So Netanyahu met with Congress on July 24th, and a few days later, we're preparing to invade Iran. I knew there was like a reason behind his visit. And I'm so back and forth with all of this because I don't want war. But at the same time, we have to defend ourselves and our allies. But as I said earlier, history repeats itself. Why did we go in the Middle East and destroy everything in the first place? Because of weapons of mass destruction that allowed us to invade Iraq, which we found out later didn't even exist. Um, so it's just like, I feel like the whole thing is repeating now because now there's weapons of mass destruction and we're going to invade Iran. Um, except now things are different because we have a new alliance that we have to worry about with our adversaries. In January of this year, we talked about this already that Iran joined BRICS, which means that they have Russia, China, India, Brazil, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates 
backing them. Like this could spark a massive world war. This isn't just about the Middle East anymore. There's so much more involved at this point. And this is super concerning. And the timing of that with the stock market crashing is not a fucking coincidence. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And it's like, again, where are Biden and Kamala? Where have they been for the last? Why aren't they talking to the people? The American right, people. Exactly. Yeah. We heard from Defense Secretary Austin, right? But nothing from the fucking president, nothing from his, you know, reportedly amazing successor, no press conference, no nothing this past week at all. According to Axios, Biden and Netanyahu apparently had a private phone call on Thursday and the media was trying to make it sound like Biden was demanding that Netanyahu stop escalating tensions and move towards an immediate ceasefire. But we heard nothing from Biden directly. And then later that same day, the White House put out a statement basically reaffirming Biden's commitment to Israel's security against all threats from Iran, including from Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and any other proxy terrorist groups. And we will continue to support Israel with new defensive U.S. military deployments, which was when we then saw Austin speak about the following day. But Stephanie, I have to point this out because the last sentence of the White House statement from Thursday was the best because it said the very last sentence, quote, Vice President Harris also joined the call, end quote. It was written like a total afterthought, like, oh, shit, I guess we should throw Kamala in there and make it look like she's doing something important, right? And when you think about it, this would have been the perfect time for her to have come out and and be the point person on a global issue that is going to have an impact on the United States, potentially more than likely becoming involved in a full scale war. Not a peep from her, not a peep from Biden. Instead, we hear from John Finner, the White House Deputy National Security Advisor, who went on CBS Face the Nation on Sunday and said that we're in a moment that appears to be of a heightened threat. And then uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken tells the G7 yesterday that a retaliatory attack on Israel is imminent. And it's like, well, no shit. And we have no viable leader in our fucking country. And get this, Stephanie. Apparently, we have also given $239 million in aid to the fucking Taliban. So this was also released last week. There was a July 2024 report from Sigar, which is the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. And this report identified at least 29 grants where the Taliban received counterterrorism funds from the United States. Why? Because there were no fucking vetting requirements from the State Department. And the best part is the State Department isn't even denying it. According to an article in Just the News that came out yesterday, the State Department, quote, acknowledged the gaps in compliance highlighted in the report, end quote. Like, you can't make this shit up. And like you said, it is now Monday, right? And it was only just before recording this podcast that we finally hear that Biden's heading to the Situation Room and they threw Kamala in there because apparently she's going to be in that discussion as well, you know? And it's like, I'm sorry, it's too little too late. Yeah, it's times like this where you see who true leaders are. Obviously, Trump, he's been posting nonstop on social media. We know where he stands. We know Netanyahu went to Mar-a-Lago and they had a whole meeting. Um, we haven't seen any leadership whatsoever from Biden or Kamala. I mean, this is no surprise. You're worried about, like Frisella said, you're worried about women's reproductive rights when like, we're on the verge of not just a, a war, but a depression, like like Trump said, a, a global recession. Not good um, at all. And in terms of the money that's going to the Taliban, let's just th put our common sense thinking caps on for a minute. When you follow the money, who benefits? It's the military industrial complex, which these politicians are a part of. And they want this. They want, we've said it time and time again. There is a reason why we were in the Middle East for 20 years. It's a lot of money for the military industrial complex. They want a constant war. And, and when you have weak leadership, they can do this. They, they knew they couldn't get away with it when Trump was in office, but they absolutely can with Biden and Kamala. There's no way she can handle a war. The woman can't even handle 
um, a press conference. Like the, there's just no way. And especially when we have countries involved that have literally no respect for women, women have no rights. They literally arrest women for not wearing their hijabs. And that's where like, I go back to what you said earlier about Trump being antagonistic. And honestly, I think we need that right now. That's why no countries messed with us when he was president, because he is a little crazy and unpredictable and he exerts power and authority. That's what we need right now. And I'm wondering if he's not trying to show that contrast between Kamala, who's never serious and always cackling and doing her whole girl power thing, versus Trump, who was shot and got up and raised his fist in the air saying, fight. Like, I think America is craving a strong, patriotic leader who's going to stand up to the evil happening all over the world. And it's like Kamala and Biden are like the substitute teacher, right? They come in and the kids wreak havoc knowing that like the real authority figure isn't there. And that's what other countries are doing. They're treating us like the substitute teachers in class. And the moment that Trump steps foot back in the classroom, they're going to immediately straighten up and knock off the games. Like, I truly believe that. And I think that that's why this is the most important election of my lifetime. Yeah. And in the meantime, it's more than likely that we're going to see U.S. troops going to war because as you were talking, another article came across my feed where John Kirby, he's our, you know, National Security Council spokesperson. He just told CNN that support for Israel could involve U.S. boots on the ground. And he said it's likely going to be a combination of both troops and equipment. He said because, quote, it's not just hardware when you're adding capability to a region. You've got to add troops into that mix as well to maintain and operate the equipment. Yeah, so why do I'm we think they've been trying to make all these, you know, changes to the draft? And I just want to point out that it was the Democrats that decided that to be equitable, they want women in the draft as well. It was Republicans that tried to stop that from happening. Um, so yeah, like this is not good with all the research that you've done on the military and how weak it's gotten. A draft could be a possibility depending on how many countries get involved. Yeah, it's, it's terrifying. crazy. And that's just the war in the Middle East that we're talking about. And how many countries did I just rattle off when I was talking about who's involved? We're not even talking about the Ukraine, Russia. We're not talking about China. We're not talking about what's happening with Taiwan. Like, there's so much shit going on. Stephanie, it's like the world is on fire right now. We've got massive anti-immigration protests going on in the UK. And um, if you guys didn't hear, there was an incident last week where an 18-year-old stabbed three kids to death and injured eight other kids at a Taylor Swift like yoga class or something in Northwest England. And so since then, it's just been constant protests, like to the point where the streets are overrun. The, you know, the police are, I think police have been attacked. I mean, it's just, it's fucking crazy. And we mentioned last week what happened with the election in Venezuela, which I still think is completely foreshadowing possibilities for our own election. And Maduro's fraudulent win of the presidency resulted in thousands of people taking to the streets in protest. They've all been rallying in support of Gonzalez, who was the candidate that reportedly won the election by a landslide. And what has Maduro done in response? He arrested 2,000 protesters and promised to send them to maximum security prisons for 30 years, which is basically the sentence for murderers. And according to Bloomberg, at least 14 reporters have been deported out of the country. And they interviewed one Venezuela citizen, Venezuelan citizen, and he said, quote, people have realized they've been deceived in front of their eyes. I only see radicalization coming, end quote. Like, Stephanie, don't you think this is just setting the stage for what has the potential to happen in the United States? I mean, we already know if Trump wins, the left's going to riot. But I also wonder if enough mainstream Americans will rise up in protest of Kamala wins, because we are seeing a lot of these protests, including like the protest in the UK right now. That's a protest from the right. It's not from the left. It's from the right that wants 
to get rid of this massive immigration. And if you're looking at what's happening in Venezuela, it's the same kind of concept where mm -hmm. you have all the people that are are fed up with these regimes that are protesting. And it's like, is mainstream America going to have the balls to do something like that? Well, unfortunately, I think when things get bad enough, yeah, like in the UK, I mean, what happened to these three little girls was horrific. And so I just want to give some context because I didn't know this until this morning. I was listening to The Morning Wire and they had this woman on that's been studying the immigration in Europe because it's it's heavily uh, Muslim population. And according to her, I forget if it was the last four years or five years, there's been like 50,000 attacks from Muslims attacking Christians. And this one, I guess, was very blatant, even though all the information hasn't come out yet. So that's why they're protesting. They're like, enough is enough. When you slaughter children, like that's we're standing up and saying no more, like get out of our country kind of thing. And what's funny, I want everyone that has TikTok like or any social media, because I guarantee this is probably censored everywhere except for TikTok. Go on TikTok and type in the UK protests or riots. Every single news media outlet throughout the world is calling them extreme right radicalists when they're literally just saying like these people are coming into our country and they're killing us like they're attacking us. The crime is through the roof like they're having all the same issues that we're having here, but it's in a greater degree because it's been more liberal. They've allowed open borders a lot longer than we have. And now it's all coming to a head. And they were in support of open borders. Yeah. Just and like they were, they were very... in support of gender affirming care. Right. And now they're backpedaling. So what America could do is we could look to Europe who was very far ahead of us, way more liberal. And we could see like, okay, they implemented it. Here's what happened. Maybe we should look at that. But no, we're going full steam ahead, making the same stupid mistakes. And in terms of Venezuela, like I absolutely think it's a preview of what we'll see here with fraud if we even have an election. What have you and I been saying? The one reason we might not have an election is war. And yeah, that might be breaking out. Um, but like just look at 2020. OK, all the propaganda and censorship has just gotten worse. And I don't I don't think that Trump protesters or Trump supporters are going to protest um, for this reason. OK. The whole I I have my little conspiracy theory that the whole reason for January 6th, I do believe it was a setup. I believe people were whatever. We know there were like FBI agents and stuff involved. And I think the reason they did that was to scare the shit out of everyone so that no one on the right ever protests again, because they've made it crystal clear that anyone on the right will be jailed without due process. We still have people in jail to this day that haven't had a hearing. And so that makes me think people won't do anything. I know like I would second guess doing anything for that reason. You look at what you just said in Venezuela, where these people are getting like sentences of like 20, 30 years and beyond. Um, I want to point something else out that's fishy. Like so much has happened over the weekend. OK, so the market crashing, the war, the Venezuela thing. Then there is this PSA bulletin from SISA and the FBI. This was posted five days ago. And you could go right on SISA.gov, it's C-I-S-A, and read it, okay? Read the whole thing. I'm just going to read part of it. It reads, quote, with election day less than 100 days away, it's important to help put into context some of the incidents the American people may see during the election cycle that, while potentially causing some minor disruptions, will not fundamentally impact the security or integrity of the democratic process, end quote. This was a quote from SISA senior advisor Kate Connolly. It goes on to say DDoS attacks are one example of a tactic that we have seen used against election infrastructure in the past and will likely see again in the future, but they will not, capitalized not, affect the security or integrity of the actual election. They may cause some minor disruptions or prevent the public from receiving timely information. It's important to talk about these potential issues now because nefarious actors like our foreign adversaries or cyber criminals could use DDoS incidents to cast doubt on election systems or processes. 
An informed public is key to neutralizing the impact of foreign influence operations and disinformation, which is why we put out this advisory on what a DDoS attack could and couldn't do, end quote. Is you that what our, shady what as hell? What our own government is going or is not going to do? Right? I mean, they're literally saying that there are going to be attacks on election infrastructure. But don't worry, because that's not going to affect security or integrity of the election. Like, I'm sorry, how the hell can you predict that? And how could you know that it's going to happen, but it's not going to affect the security of the election? Like, how would you know that ahead of time? Do you have a crystal ball and you could read the future? Like, they're planning this. It's plain as day. They're planning it. They're conditioning the people. So when there is election fraud, we don't question it because it was all anticipated. They told us, hey, it's coming, but don't worry. Don't worry about it. Like, how much more in our face can this shit be? <laughs> yeah. And if the election fraud theory doesn't work out, there's always the bird flu, right? Because you guys know I like to follow all the news that's linked to the push to create a pandemic out of the bird flu. So I have to bring up what happened last week with the WHO announcing a new project to accelerate development of vaccines for bird flu infections. So this effort is being led by an Argentinian company called Synergium Biotech, and I guess they're creating cutting-edge mRNA vaccine that has technology, materials, and expertise that will then be rolled out through the UN's mRNA technology transfer program to manufacturers in poorer countries so that they can develop and produce their own vaccines. And the head of the WHO's vaccine research unit, Martin Fried, he recently revealed that half the manufacturers in the program have already started installing the necessary equipment to develop and produce these mRNA-based vaccines. Scenes. How convenient, Stephanie. Okay, it's pretty bad when you say the UN and immediately I'm like, red flag, because I don't trust those fuckers whatsoever. And then it's like, oh, they're going to roll these out to poor countries. Mm -hmm. I'm like, is this a biological weapon? Because it sure sounds like that. And yeah, of course, like, again, right in time for election season, and you've got the MSM falling right in line with the pandemic. And in case anyone like doesn't believe me, I'm just going to read some headlines just from the past couple of days over the weekend. From Axios, bird flu hits Minnesota fair season. From SciTech Daily, urgent countermeasures are needed. Researchers find blowflies carrying bird flu in Japan. From WOI5, CDC faces bird flu, working on precautions for humans. From the New York Times, is New York ready for the bird flu? From AccuWeather, prevent supercharged flu virus, or to prevent supercharged flu virus, CDC pushed seasonal flu vaccines to farm workers at risk of co-infection with the bird flu. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Just go search it and you'll see. I mean, and here's the thing. They're going to really try to amp up the fear. And we cannot fall for it. We have to use common sense. Like, remember the whole fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Like, I don't think people are going to fall for it again. And they know that. So they're going to try to do everything to put massive amounts of fear in us. And what worries me is now that they have this mRNA technology just reading all those headlines and what you just said, Tara, are they going to use it in the seasonal flu vaccine? And so everyone, you know, go get the flu vaccine because just like that one uh, headline said, co-infection with the bird flu and the regular flu, I mean, that could be deadly. So you better go get your flu vaccine that probably has the mRNA technology. And based on like, that CDC headline, everything they did in 2020, I'm betting, I am betting that's exactly what's going to happen. So we have to do our research and apply common sense. And it goes for the bird flu propaganda, the Kamala propaganda, and pretty much anything that MSM says at this point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my gosh. So anyhow, um, that's a very negative way to start off a Monday morning. <laughs> Sorry, guys. What a weekend. Like, but, okay, here's where we all need to just 
like, look at the positive, okay? There is a chance, there is a big chance that Trump can get in in November. And I truly think if he does, that is the one and only thing that is going to course correct the disaster that the past three and a half years has brought us. So everyone just like stay positive. Like let's put some good intentions out there for Trump and just spread the word, like share these episodes. If you get even one other person to change their mind and see the truth of what's happening, like that could be a tipping point if enough people did that. So let's just try to like control what we can control, share the information and just keep, you know, hoping and praying that Trump will get in in November. Yes. So I hope you have a good day. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll see you back here on Wednesday. We'll keep you updated with all the all the new stuff that's coming out. Um, so thank you for tuning in and have try to have as good of a day as you possibly can with the information we know. If you're sick of all the crazy shit going on in our country and you want to express your support and patriotism for the show, head on over to our Etsy store at UO Patriot Chicks and check out our new stickers. The link can also be found on our website. If you love the show and you want exclusive episodes, support the podcast and join the conversation by becoming a member of our Patreon community. We'll be posting weekly member-only podcast episodes and content that isn't available on the weekly podcast. Every Patreon member will also get a free, unapologetically outspoken sticker and updates about our new sticker release before they're made public. And be sure to follow us on TikTok at Unapologetically Outspoken. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast. The more you support us, the more people we can reach. So help us spread the word.